good afternoon, depending on where you are. Normally, I don't just read a statement, but in these circumstances, uh, I'm going to uh, read a fair bit because I have limited time and I want to make sure that I don't miss anything. When the commission was first established, we had an opportunity to participate and uh, I immediately submitted a request and we were granted standing. Uh, and then part of that process, I ended up being contacted by some surviving family members uh, of the victims. I had the opportunity to, to chat with them about their feelings uh, around the, this whole, whole experience. And that experience in itself reinforced my belief that the reason for all of this is to bring justice to the victims. And my understanding of that justice in this case is, number one, bringing to the public's view what actually happened on April 18th and 19th, 2020. And secondly, what we can do to avoid this from happening again, if that is at all possible. I can only imagine what a painful experience it is for uh, friends and family of, of the victims to go through all of this for a period of, of around two years. It's, uh, it's unimaginable to me. It's been quite clear that there have been groups and individuals uh, that have viewed this tragedy as an opportunity to get their message out or to use this suffering as a platform for their agenda. And in my opinion, um, this behavior is abhorrent, but it happens every single time. There's a tragedy like this every, every, every time, and I think we can do better. This is why, while I'm representing the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights or the CCFR, I have strictly limited my comments to my expertise and to the facts of this specific case without deviation. Uh, this is the reason our group was given standing, and I take that very seriously. Uh, my comments today will, again, apply to the mass casualty event that is in front of us and answer to the mandate of this commission as I, at least I understand it. Earlier this year, we submitted our preliminary report as part of our work for the commission. At this point, I've had the benefit of five months of additional information provided by the commission. After considering the foregoing, very little has changed about our opinion in fact. A violent and erratically behaved resident of Nova Scotia committed the largest spree shooting in Canadian history. This individual was well known by police on a few different levels. It's complicated. Uh, this individual had a history of violent behavior, including the issuance of death threats going back beyond a decade. Another fact, this individual and his concerning behavior was well known in the community going well back beyond a decade. Uh, it was well known that this individual had engaged in other unlawful behavior, including being in unauthorized possession of firearms, a very serious criminal offense in Canada. It was an open secret in the community. In fact, it was established that all the firearms used to commit the murders were illegally smuggled into Canada from the United States. Now, just in case anyone's unsure, firearm prohibitions in Canada are not enforceable um, in other countries, just to make sure everybody understands that. Uh, now, he was in possession of one domestically sourced firearm obtained through fraud, though there's no conclusive evidence that he used that firearm against anyone during the mass casualty event, nor was it necessary for him to do so. He had other options. And it has been established that the perpetrator did not possess a firearms license in Canada at any time, nor did he have any demonstrable links to the firearms community in Canada. These are the non-controversial facts of the mass casualty event. And it's my understanding that these facts are not, as, not disputed by anyone in this inquiry. From the perspective of the regulation of firearms in Canada, laws or regulations that may have had some effect in preventing or mitigating the mass casualty are fairly easy to identify. The reason is because there were almost none of them. The only regulation that could have had any influence on this tragedy is found in section 117 of the criminal code. And that regulation, as it is today, was more than sufficient to serve its intended purpose. So in plain language, Section 117 allows a peace officer to apply to a court for a search warrant, or in some cases, search without a warrant with the intent to seize firearms or weapons or other prohibited devices uh, in the interest of public safety. It seems that the opportunity to use Section 117 presented itself on a few occasions, particularly in light of death threats made by the perpetrator, the frequent discharge of illegally possessed firearms, uh, members of the community being aware of this possession, and a handful of concerning interactions with police. Again, some complicated ones, uh, but those are beyond my purview. There's a high degree of frontline police discretion involved in deploying Section 117. 
uh, the powers of search and seizure there. And I'd be interested in further analysis uh, on this from experts who are more qualified than I am uh, on this topic itself. This is an important aspect of this inquiry. And I sincerely hope, I'm almost desperately hope, that the commission pursues an explanation of why these regulatory measures weren't exercised. They are well understood by frontline police officers. So again, this is a very serious problem. Now, I do want to hypothesize uh, for just a moment about what I just suggested. So maybe, if we're just throwing it around, maybe local law enforcement could have acted on one of these complaints uh, that they received over the preceding decade. Um, maybe they dug around a little bit and they're able to obtain a search warrant the search. Maybe the perpetrator was too smart and no firearms were found. Alternatively, maybe firearms were found. And maybe through some lengthy legal process, the perpetrator was no longer able to legally across the legally across cross the border into the United States, which were the numerous trips that he made smuggling these firearms back from a different jurisdiction. Would that have affected his ability to source the firearms he used? These are interesting questions, but I might suggest that with this individual, his level of intellectual confidence, his financial resources, he would have likely found a way to achieve his goals regardless. We've seen that in other crimes in Canada time and time again. But again, the Section 117 powers were the only applicable laws that may have possibly made a difference. It seems they weren't used. Now, on the contrary, every other firearm regulation in Canada had absolutely no effect in mitigating or preventing this tragedy, not a single one, not magazine size restrictions, uh, not possession offenses, storage, transportation regulations, certainly not any Australian style gun buybacks uh, or the innumerable prohibitions that we've seen before or after the mass casualty event. Not a single law uh, could have had any influence on what happened. If all firearms were banned in Canada for the last hundred years, I've said this before, this tragedy would have happened exactly the same way. There's no way around it. It's a physical reality. It's physically true. So, and I, and I know it's an uncomfortable truth for, um, you know, people involved in this inquiry, but it's just, it's the way it is. And it, it, that in itself is, is difficult. Uh, a little more undeniably true information. Adam and Carol Fisher were in their home. And I mentioned this before in our first uh, oral uh, presentation. We're in their home when the perpetrator uh, drove up their driveway. The perpetrator was acquainted with the Fishers and knew Adam Fisher was a legal gun owner. It also so happens that Adam Fisher had a legally owned loaded shotgun at the ready, that's my understanding, while Carol Fisher was on the line with 911. I'm not privy to exactly what happened, uh, but I'd be interested in, in knowing more. But I'll say this, Adam and Carol Fisher survived this interaction with the perpetrator. Um, and I'll also add, not a shot was fired. It seems like the perpetrator was deterred, but we don't we don't know that for sure. I can say this though, if there was a gun ban in, in Canada for the last hundred years, like I mentioned, is there anyone who thinks that this interaction would have ended the way that it did? These are the only people to survive an interaction with the perpetrator at their home. They're the only ones. If the intent of all this is to save innocent lives, this part of the story needs to be honestly and seriously considered. It's, it's part of the fact pattern. Uh, I realize it's inconvenient for a few people involved in this inquiry on the periphery, uh, but if we're here for the right reasons, this needs to be highlighted and considered in the commission's final report. In any case, I intend to pursue a little bit more information on a few of the things that I mentioned today. And uh, I'd like to invite everyone to read our final report to be submitted to the commission in early October and reply submissions in late October. So I'll end it there. And I thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Giltaka.